Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for Josh Adams. So hey, everybody. Welcome to my, uh, my first keynote. So thanks for being part of it. Um, so I just want to start out thanking Brian and the organizers at the conference. Um, it's really cool. This is a really cool venue. I really like it. Uh, and also thanks everybody that, that came to listen to me speak. I know there are lots of tracks you could have been at. Um, so uh, my talk has 150 slides, so I'll stop rambling and get started. Uh, I'm going to talk about building systems. Um, it consists of, uh, the talk consists of three parts. So the first part of the talk is a broad overview of what, what systems are. Yeah, this is where we get our dictionary definition and the properties that we care about in them. The uh, second part is a discussion of the tools that I personally find useful for building systems and managing systems over time and making sure that they're good. Uh, and then an argument for why each of these things is important and you should actually use them. Um, and then the final part is, is a detailed look at how you can deploy a production system based on the systems that I've been building in the past year or so for customers. Um, so we'll cover building a release, building a container in Docker, versioning the containers, managing infrastructure around your system with code, and handling continuous delivery. Um, so the first thing we should address, what are systems? Uh, oftentimes people think this, uh, I built a thing in C, um, and that's, that's fair. Um, there's a paper in 1972, though, by this guy R. Daniel Bergeron and others, uh, and it was one of the earlier page papers that discussed systems programming languages as a thing. Um, the paper begins with a definition from Webster at the time. A system is an assemblage of objects united by some form of regular interaction or interdependence, an organized whole. And in programming terms, he took that to mean an integrated set of subprograms together forming a whole greater than the sum of its parts and exceeding some threshold of size and or complexity. So systems, right? Things we build that have lots of pieces. Uh, it also gives a partial set of properties that you can use to identify systems. It's not an exact heuristic, but it smells right. So the problem to be solved is of a broad nature consisting of many and usually quite varied subproblems. Uh, it's likely to be used to support other software and application programs, but may be a complete application itself. It's designed for continued production use. This is not a thing that you fire once and forget. Uh, it's likely to be continuously evolving in the number and types of features that it supports, and it requires certain discipline or structure, both within and between modules, i.e. communication, and it's usually designed and implemented by more than one person. So that, those are the properties broadly. Let's like figure out if we're writing systems, if that's the things we're building. Um, so broad nature, many and varied sub-problems. Like, let's think about the systems we build. Like things we work on presently have Event streams running through them, they interact with persistent stores, they offload work to image processing subsystems, they have an HTTP interface and an API, there's web sockets along polling, we have mobile and web clients that talk over a standardized interface. Uh, we have to monitor them, we have to log, uh, we have to be able to manage the logs and we have to update them over time. So I'm pretty sure we qualify on this point. Uh, pretty much everything we build. Uh, also, likely to be used to support other software and applications. Okay, this one's easy, like if we build an API, we qualify for this. Um, designed for continued production use, we maintain systems over time. When we build things, we should build them thinking they're going to live, because uh, if they don't, they failed, uh, which means that any successful system is going to become a legacy system. So like, anybody ever worked on legacy systems that suck? Anybody? Like, show of hands. OK, so like, that's the thing you're working on if you don't do good, So um, just like two years from now. So don't do that. Um, it's likely to be continuously evolving. Uh, so since we have to continuously evolve the system, uh, it's one of the fundamental properties of systems, then that means we need to be confident in delivering updates to our system. So can, can you say presently that you can continuously deliver updates multiple times a day, smoothly, regularly, with no anxiety, um, to your systems? Like, oftentimes, like, maybe that's true for 70% of the system, and then there's the part that nobody wants to touch. And that, that should be uncomfortable. Um, and also, it requires certain discipline or structure. So ab about this, like, that's sort of your, your API a little bit, right? You have communication, you have types that represent how things are, are distributed throughout the system. Um, so like languages with explicit type systems are like Dialyzer or Elm. I, li I like Elm. I talk about Elm a lot. Uh, these are really helpful because you do have to explicitly define your types. And also GraphQL. So like huge fan of GraphQL. I'll mention it again later. But um, GraphQL API schema is really good. Uh, people do code generation from them. And this is, it's a good thing. So use types. They'll help with that. Uh, and also, they're implemented by more than one person, and this inherently means you also need a certain discipline or structure in your process uh, that you go through to build your systems. Because your systems problem, since you have more than one person, became a people problem, and we're weird. So um, these are the properties that define systems. We are already building systems. I'm pretty sure most of you would have checked off most of those items. Um, so that means you need to be thinking about them as systems, not just as some code I'm going to run 
and it does this task, but like a system that solves this problem and is going to solve this problem four years from now and how it's going to get better. Um, you may already know this. A lot of people probably already think of things as systems, but I personally find it helpful to very explicitly think like not this is a program, but this is a thing that is used for this purpose in the world um, because it shapes how I approach my work. For instance, I'm less likely to write cowboy code if I think of the project not as a code base, but as a thing that like this other guy is going to have to maintain and he's going to be mad at me late at night. Um, and yeah, also the properties that we mentioned require my code to be able to evolve over time, and that means you have to have a test suite. Um, so it's easy to lose sight of like why we build systems, but ultimately we build systems for humans. Uh, the goal of what the code we put out is to improve the lives of humans. So we should think about that. You know, it's not just to, to cross this item off a, off a Jira list. Um, if you can't deliver a feature on time because your process is suboptimal, you're not just like slow, but you're failing at the purpose of your system. You're not making somebody's life better. Um, but also, remember the people that build the systems are human too. So like, we're people, we're not as reliable as computers, we're bags of meat. Um, we should probably have automation that helps us apply like policies to ensure the quality of our work. Because computers can do that, they're really good at it. And when we're in like really good position, we think like, I want this to be really well tested and good. But then like, our dogs get sick, and we kind of don't pay as much attention to what we're doing. And computers can help that not cause problems down the road. Um, anyway, and also don't build a system that nobody's happy working on, because people have to work on it. So if you hate working on the system, like fix that problem. It's a really big problem. Um, Ernie Miller is a guy I like. He created this Humane Development Manifesto. You can see it at humanedevelopment.org. But in general, the idea is keep your mind on the fact that you're working with humans and for humans. Um, so all right, systems are for humans. Humans need reliability. Um, if they're going to use the systems for their purpose, they need to trust that it's going to work. Um, so that means we need a process that's going to give them that reliability so that it's not just some program, but it's an actual thing that they rely on. Like when email is down, it sucks, right? Email is a thing you can rely on for the most part. Um, we need to build things like that. Um, and we, so we need to be able to continuously improve the system. Also, humans are lazy, uh, which means your developers are lazy. To, so to solve for this, make it the path of least resistance to do the right thing. Um, and to do that, you need a process. Um, it needs to embody what the right thing is for your system. So you need to think about what, what constraints you want to put on your system, uh, like formatting or test suites or smoke tests or various things. Um, this is the place, like applying your process is the place where you get to control how your system works, what it does. Uh, it's not the code, it's the part where you're defining what the system is, and that's kind of your process layer. Um, I've been involved in a ton of projects, and for everyone that has some good process that produces code we would be proud of, uh, there are probably nine that just pay, if, if that, they pay lip service. Like, uh, very often people have a test suite, and they haven't written a test in it for a while, but like, it's mostly green. I think somebody ran it recently. Um, that's not good enough. Um, so since the process has the, the greatest effect on the properties of your system, um, it's not an add-on. It's not a thing that you like spend a couple of minutes, you have a test suite, you make sure it runs, and then that's the last time you think about it. Um, if somebody on your team isn't working on improving or at least thinking about this part of your system, you should fix that, because um, this is where you define what it is. And the process that you choose is going to determine the properties your system has. Like, is it reliable? It's not going to be unreliable because Joe wrote code at 2 AM. He should never be able to get the bad code that he wrote because he was sleepy into, the, into production. And so the process is what gives your system your properties, not the, not the um, quality of the, the people writing the code, honestly. Um, anyway, so. Uh, in the next section, I'm going to share s some bits of my process that I think yield good results for me. Um, so let's do that. Uh, people use lots of tools to build systems. I I'm not trying to say use exactly this, do exactly this, but I have preferences, and I think people don't talk about this sort of thing enough, and so I wanted to do it. Uh, so uh, I'm going to deep dive into the tools that I prefer, and then right after this, we have a section where we're going to deploy a production setup system for a system. So we'll deploy a Kubernetes cluster with all our applications running. We'll define the infrastructure as code. We'll mesh our Elixir cluster inside of Kubernetes. We'll set up continuous deployment. And we'll introduce monitoring with Prometheus and Grafana. And it'll go quickly, because these tools are really good. Anyway, so you need systems to build your systems, yo dog. And um, the first tool in my tool belt is Elixir. So I prefer Elixir for like all of my backend stuff. This is probably not surprising if, if anybody knows me. I've been kind of talking it up for five years. Uh, but I figure people are here, they probably built systems with Elixir already, so you don't need me to convince you of its value proposition. 
I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, the reason I prefer it is that there's a really nice combination of speedy development and prototyping. Uh, so the tooling makes it really easy to get a project started and carry you on to production without having to change much. Uh, Dialyzer is awesome. You should be using it. It gives you types, and types are good because otherwise you're, you're living in the west, wild west. Um, typing with Dialyzer improves guarantees in the system substantially. You can just know, like, oh, that's, that's a bug, like very clearly a bug. I should remove it. And without something like Dialyzer, very often you don't. And so you just have the bug, but you don't know about it, but you sleep well. Um, also, uh, interop with Elixir is really freaking cool. It's really good. We have ports, we have NIFs, C nodes, Java nodes. Um, so you have escape hatches. When you need something that is easily accessible over in this other language, but like, ah, I'm in Elixir, like that's not a problem. You can, you can talk to it through traditional methods or like by hosting a C library or hosting a Java um, server. So uh, I feel like this is not publicly praised enough and you, you might should use it. Uh, recently we used it for inter interfacing with Jasper reports. So like this is huge Java library that does a lot of stuff, right? Like, nobody needs to rewrite that in Elixir. Uh, and it's like, I don't know, 100 lines of code and we can do all the stuff we want to do with it from an Elixir interface. Uh, it's really cool. And also because systems are distributed. So like this is actually what brought me to Elixir in the first place because the Beam is just very well suited to building distributed systems. And I started working on them and my life was really bad and then I switched to Elixir and my life is really good now. Um, and so like I'm gonna make a specious claim here. Um, so we use Elixir to build systems. So like cool, it's a systems programming language. We can do that. Uh, but we can also feel free to use it to escape hatches if we need an actual systems programming language. Um, anyway. So Elixir, cool, you should use that. You also need to write tests. This probably should have come first, but it's an Elixir conference, so Elixir came first. Um, Test-driven development combines automation with laziness to help you build great systems. Um, you should write tests. Think of the test suite as a uh, declarative representation of how your system works. So this is the place where you get to like, not worry about the nitty-gritty implementation details, but you say, like, I transferred money. Like, it should probably have moved. And then you get to verify that every time anybody makes any changes to your code. Um, so these things help you enforce the desired behavior of your system. They're really important. They're like super duper important. Uh, you should write your test first. Um, it makes it easier to play with how an API feels ahead of time uh, before you implement it. So like, it's really bad if you spent 30 minutes making this kind of intricate API and then you actually go to write your test afterwards, which you shouldn't do, and it feels clunky and awful to use and you think, ah, you know, this really would feel better, but now I burned 30 minutes and I'm done. Like, no, do the playing with it before the, the implementing it. Like, it makes for better code. Um, anyway. So if a test suite passes without your code, uh, you have written irrelevant code. Um, your team should expect untested code to be deleted. And if you're a person on a team and you want it to be really good, delete to code that passes. Like if you can pass a test suite, with, you can run a fuzzer. You can run a, um, uh, a fuzzer through your pro program that just deletes code. And like if the test suite passes after it deleted the code, don't put it back. Um, if you do that, I guarantee you've got really good test coverage, but you might break stuff initially. Um, so to further drive that point home, here's a tweet from my buddy Aldrich. He's right there. Um, so if you disagree with him, find him and tell him that he's wrong. Um, he said, I think it's unprofessional and unethical for software developers not to do test-driven development. Um, I agree pretty much. I think it's definitely unprofessional. Um, I don't want to work on a team with you if you don't, at the very least, write tests. Like, you have to be, at least be capable and very comfortable with test-driven development. It may be that you could make an argument that some component didn't need it or whatever, but I think you're wrong. But it's definitely unprofessional. Um, so, like, I don't know, how would you feel if like, the guy making the bridge was like, well, I'm pretty sure. Like, it looks good. <laughs> like, no. And we're supposed to be professionals. Like, we're the people that are the, the professionals doing it. We can't say that's good enough. Um, and also, if you fail to write tests, you can't evolve your system over time. And so you don't, you, it's going to suck two years from now. Uh, so th the test suite, or really the CI, is the gatekeeper to your system. It describes the behavior, it guards against regressions, it allows you to improve over time, and it's the place you get to do this stuff. And so remember, uh, the program requires a certain discipline and structure, um, and it's written by people, right? This is why we do it. It's not just me saying, like, write tests. I'm saying write tests because the system is worked on by people, and it needs structure, and this is the way you do that part. Um, so uh, to reiterate, you should write a test. Uh, even if it's just one test. You don't have to start out elaborately, get something going if you don't. Anything is better than nothing. And I'm not kidding, like I really don't want to work on a project if you haven't written any tests at all. Um, nobody else should either. It's a bad practice. Um, this is the thing I suck at though. Uh, so you should fix flaky tests. Um, everybody needs to be confident around the test suite. You need to say like, this is it, this is good. And like very often, on projects that I'm working on right now, 
every eight runs or whatever, it's indeterminate, like this test suite fails. And right now we just put up with it. We click the rebuild button, we go drink a cup of coffee and like, yeah, everything's good, we probably shouldn't panic. But uh, like the test suite's supposed to be the thing that describes your system and you can't rely on it, then it's not gonna be. And uh, anyway, so little process hack to fix this. This is what I'm doing now and I think it's, I think it's helpful, but early stages. I used to do this and uh, I stopped for some reason. So run the test suite against master every hour. Just have a thing that runs your test suite constantly, all freaking day, against master. Master's always supposed to pass. So like if it passes, be really noisy about, about the failure, like page people while they're asleep, whatever. Um, because it'll fix itself. Like you can do that, put that process in place, I guarantee you, uh, third time you get a text at 3 a.m., you're gonna figure out what the freaking problem is. Um, anyway. Uh, so you should also be running code coverage. Uh, this is just so you know which parts of your code actually are covered. Uh, it's not proof that the code is good, but it proves that at least something ran it, uh, and that's good. So ultimately, you should be able to see that every important part of your system has test coverage, and you need to know which parts don't have test coverage. Um, anyway, uh, some notes, like don't shoot for 100%. That's silly, you waste time. Uh, you should be like around 80% maybe. It, it varies, this is very much a feel. But it should not be zero, it should not be 20 probably about 80% test coverage, um, and then make the justification for anywhere around, away from there. Because um, if you try to get to 100%, you get into the weeds testing things that like, you know they work, I know they work. It's not really benefiting anybody, and if you think about the fact that the system is for humans, you need to be spending your time benefiting people. So anyway. Um, also, if you, actually, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So okay, like pick your, build, pick your coverage level that's important to you, 80%, 70%, 20%, whatever and reject the build. So when somebody makes a pull request and it would bring test coverage below 80%, they don't get to merge that code. And now one of the properties your system has is it's at least 80% test covered, like all the time. And it's not like it's a thing you strive for, it's, all, it's like enforced by your continuous integration system. So like you can set that and forget it and know that you've got test coverage. Um, and if you don't have a test suite or if you have terrible test coverage, like make it 10% and then just bump it up 5% every week, right? You can, you can do this slowly. But you should not be okay not knowing which parts of your code aren't covered by your test suite. Um, so, yeah. And then ultimately, uh, pull requests have to pass the suite in order to get in. And then, cool, code coverage is done. Uh, you should probably pick a format uh, for your code because I've been on a lot of teams where they argue over format and that's a stupid, stupid, unbelievable waste of time and nobody should be doing it because it's stupid. Um, <laughs> So you don't have to like how it looks. Like I, don't, I, did, I really disliked Elm format for like four months. I, just I don't like four spaces, what are you doing? This is the stupidest thing ever. But that's how code in Elm looks, so I just used it and now I like it just fine. You don't have to like it, just pick, stick to a standard because there's, there's, it's more than just like having it look pretty. It like reduces code churn unnecessarily, people adding commas. Um, so in Elixir you have uh, mixed format, Elm has Elm format, in JavaScript, you have a few options like standard or prettier standard, uh, but maybe don't write JavaScript. So like TypeScript has TS format, and, um, or you could write Elm, and I've already mentioned Elm format. So uh, put it in your editor. Like this is really easy, and then everybody's code is always formatted right. Like nobody's wasting time on it. Um, so do it, like don't, don't not do it. Um, and I mentioned this, uh, well I mentioned this about code coverage, but also reject PRs that don't match the format. So, uh, in your continuous integration suite, you can just run this, mix format, check formatted, and make it fail the test. And then forever, from now on, one of the properties your systems ha system has is the code is formatted by this standard. And like, that's a cool thing. And it took like one line of code to make that property in your system. And if you try to do it manually, like you're not gonna, it's gonna suck. So I don't know, don't do it the hard way. Um, anyway, so continuous integration is the way you run these tests, right? The way you make sure these properties apply to your system. It's the practice of merging all developer working copies to a shared mainline several times a day. I don't know why this sounds like a very, this feels like a very old definition of continuous integration, and it is. Um, but the point is you don't need long running branches. You need a process that like frequently gets code in. Um, and the continuous integration part is to make sure that it's smooth to get the code in because it's constantly merged with master and you know it works and it's been tested against what it would look like when it gets merged with master. Um, you should do this at the beginning of a project, like probably the first thing. This is the first thing we do on our projects. We set up a repo. We write a, a dummy test, we set up continuous integration, we set up continuous deployment, and we deploy something that doesn't do anything. Like that's step one in any project. Because now that part's done, and you've got the place you can put your process, and you don't have to think about deployment, you can work on actually the things that benefit humans. Um, anyway, so like, if you haven't set up continuous integration or continuous deployment before, it might be like daunting 
Uh, it's not. It's really easy, and you're being ridiculous if you feel that way. I felt that way before I, it was a long time ago, but before I actually got into it, I was like, oh, I see all these, like, cool stuff these, peop these people are doing, and, like, they're running all these tests, and, like, they're branching in parallel. It looks real hard. It's not real hard. Like, there's really good tools for, for doing it. Um, anyway, and it's good engineering practice. So the way we manage this is we connect our continuous integration to GitHub. Uh, we turn on a setting in GitHub that rejects pushes to master. So like nobody can push to master on our, brain, on our projects. Um, they always have to go through a pull request. And then you can't merge a pull request unless it passes a review and it, has, it passes the, the automated code review and it passes continuous uh, the, your test suite. Um, and then cool, like now you've got another property, like no code gets into this repo that hasn't gone through our gatekeeper. Um, it's a really cool property. It's a, it's a couple of things you click in GitHub, and then you get a really cool system out of it. Um, anyway, I meant to show you a screenshot of that, but I am a lazy individual. Uh, all right, so we've established you have to write tests. You have to run the tests. The way that I run tests typically is Semaphore. There's lots of services. There's uh, Travis, super popular. There's running your own Jenkins, which I did for a long time, but I think is a waste of time unless you're a huge organization uh, because it, it's hard to keep Jenkins up to date. Uh, there's like Circle CI. There's lots of things. I like Semaphore though. Um, they just announced this Semaphore 2 thing. So it's a uh, continuous integration and delivery platform. You're going to use something like this to run your test suite. Uh, this is what their version 2 looks like. It's all like CLI based and uh, configuration file based. This is a fake example. This is not our actual thing because uh, they only released 2.0 this week, and I was preparing for this. So I didn't. I didn't write our. I didn't write our test suite in it yet. Anyway, but this is what it looks like. And this is sort of the way you can think about it, right? So like they're doing a build, they're running smoke tests, then they're running unit tests in parallel. And if those all pass, they move on to the integration test. If the integration test pass, they push their image to a Docker, a Docker registry. And now they're, they have a container that represents that particular commit in their project's lifecycle or that particular tag version. And then cool, like they have a, a unit of deployment. Um, I mentioned code coverage. I wanted to show the tool that I use for this. It's called Coveralls. Uh, the point is to show you which parts of your code are not being covered by your test suite. Uh, it looks like this on a long-standing long project. You know, I've got 84% test coverage on this. I'm really happy with that. I don't feel like anything is undercovered, really. Um, but I might look at these four things at the bottom and say, like, oh, no, like one of these things actually probably should be covered, even though I'm happy with 84%. So like, it's a good density of information to think about your system at that level. Like, which, this really ought to be covered. Um, also, by the way, there's mixed test dash dash cover now in Elixir 1.7, so like that's probably pretty useful if you don't want to use coveralls. Um, you should use a linter or some service that will do automated code reviews. So um, like we know some bad things to do when writing code. Like for instance, yeah, off by one errors, right? There there are ways you can write code that avoid off by one errors. Um, we know it's a bad idea to like give ourselves the 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 rope to shoot ourselves in the foot with, if I can coin a stupid aphorism. <laughs> um, and so like, you just shouldn't, like we know how to fix these things. We have automated code review tools. You should be using them. Like it's really dumb not to use one of these things. Uh, I didn't use them for a long time. It's, it's really dumb. Uh, Ebert, this is from Platform Tech. It gives you thorough code reviews and ship with confidence. So you, it, it covers JavaScript and Ruby and Elixir, obviously, because it's from Platform Tech. Uh, and it helps you keep humans focused on like the big picture thinking and this can catch all the little issues that like, we know how to automate for. So it'll review style, like your code style. It'll review duplicated code. So it'll say, hey, you've got this thing, like copy and paste to three places, maybe a function. Um, it'll uh, tell you about known security issues. It'll tell you to do more stuff. It supports a ton of analysis engines. And if you pay for it, you're directly supporting Platform Tech, and they're the people that made Elixir. So like, go give them money, and uh, then you get nice stuff like this. Uh, so this is a pull request example. It's not an amazing example, but this is from a production system. And here it said, hey, like, you're kind of wastefully using this, uh, this pipeline. Like, I don't actually care about that personally, but a lot of times it gives us uh, more useful things. Maybe you uh, have, a, have a bound variable and you never reference it. Uh, whatever. It'll catch all this stuff and just make your code better, and you don't have to do anything. You don't have to think about it. Um, so do that. Also use this thing. Uh, it's Dependabot. It works with Elixir. It creates pull requests to keep your dependencies secure and up to date. So like, oftentimes it'll take me like 30 minutes or so of actual time loss to upgrade a minor package version just because I've got to go, okay, I've got to make a feature branch, I've got to update it, I've got to run the test suite, I've got to run smoke tests, like this takes some time, six minutes or so, like I'm probably not gonna go do something else. So ultimately it burns 30 minutes of my day. And like I could not burn 30 minutes of my day, I just use this thing, what it does is when it sees that you have a dependency uh, that has an update, it will just make a branch with that update and then send you a pull request. And then your automation runs your test suite. And then you have a green button at the bottom that says like, 
the stuff you said should work still works, and the version is bigger. Do you want it? And you click the green button, and you got it. And like, that's way better than spending 30 minutes trying to figure it out yourself. Um, all right, so that's like all the process tooling, I think, that I, that I cover. I wanted to mention this just because GraphQL has been amazing. Um, I didn't jump on the GraphQL bandwagon until they sorted out the, the patent clause, just on principle. Uh, so once they did that, I, I got all over it. I really like it, um, and I've really enjoyed using it. So if you're using GraphQL and Elixir, you're almost certainly using Absinthe. There's a talk about it later today. Uh, I don't need to convince you because it's what you'll use. Um, I do want to point out that it, it feels uh, really well thought out, Absinthe. Um, I've also written GraphQL servers in JavaScript, and it's like the native place to write GraphQL servers, right? It's got lots of tooling, and I prefer Absinthe between the two. Uh, it feels good. Anyway, so this is how you're, you support other software and applications programs, potentially, right? Your GraphQL API. So it's part of your system. It's a thing that makes it a system. Um, and it also gives you the structure between, with intermodule communication. It's, it says this is how the mobile client gets data out of the database through the, the back end. Um, so it's nice that it kind of, it's not just like make a REST API. It's a prescriptive thing that says here, like here are types. You should use them. Here's clients that can talk to it. It's good. Um, I default to GraphQL APIs now, and I don't regret it at all. I think you should consider doing it. If you're not using GraphQL, you should at least experiment with it. It, makes, it has made my life better, and I want other people to have better lives. Um, one of the really cool things is it gives you a detailed type spec. So it says, like, it's not, I work on REST APIs regularly, uh, like, consuming them. And all the time, there's one uh, for the Saudi Arabian, like, shipping. And it says, like, here's this API call, here's how you construct it. And the response type is, like, a blob. It's, it, I'm going to give you a response. I'm not going to say what the response looks like in my API documentation. I'm just telling you that, yes, in fact, you will get a thing. Um, it's typed. The type is like string or something, but it's typed. Uh, but they don't send a string. They send a blob of like JSON. Um, and I have no idea what's in it. Like literally, I ha and, and I can't access it except for in production because it's a crazy API. So literally, I have to like ship packages to learn how the API works. That's silly. You can't even do that with GraphQL. Like there's... I suppose you could. It's really, you'd have to really work against the grain. Um, anyway, so it's cool, and you can use these types that you provide by building your schema to generate stuff. So uh, I will always proselytize for Elm. I think it makes your life better. Um, if you use Elm, there's this thing called Elm GraphQL from Dylan Kearns, and it will generate uh, lots of really awesome, like, it'll generate a, a, a GraphQL client and types to represent all the queries and mutations and types and scalars in your schema. Um, it's really awesome. Uh, kind of here's, here's kind of what it looks like. So um, we, generate a, we can generate a query. So like queries.get category query returns a query. We can send it with our HTTP client to the GraphQL endpoint. We can tag on our token header. Uh, we say send it and then like turn my, the thing I got back into this, uh, into this other type, map it into this wrapping type. Um, but then like getting the query, this is a uh, query.selection. This is uh, the API that's generated for me. Uh, from Elm GraphQL. And like it knows there's a category query. And it knows that the category query has a required field, uh, a required argument that's ID. So like I can't even construct the query without passing it the ID. I can't like, I can't compile my code without, without writing the query correctly. Um, it also knows what type of thing gets returned. So uh, I have to write a decoder that will work with the type of data that's being returned or else again my compiler will fail me. So like I'm forced to take this data at the edge of the system, like at the GraphQL interface in my Elm client and hoist it up into my internal type system, like the, the types that I use to really represent categories in my client. And I'm forced to do it at the edge, essentially, with this decoder layer. But it turns out like that's actually a really good property to do. You should always take user input or external system data, and as soon as you get it, you should turn it into your internal representations. And like the only time it should leave those is like right before it leaves your system. So you should always be decoding and encoding at the edges of systems. And I just like that Elm kind of requires you to do it. Like anything else is really uncomfortable. Um, OK, so back to Elixir. Uh, if you build releases and you're going to build releases, you're going to use Distillery. Uh, it's a tool to simplify deployments in Elixir with OTP releases. Uh, here's a pretty basic way to, this is a production, like this is a production release that I have. Um, so I'm saying, hey, look in the VM args for the cookie. Uh, I have some pre-start things, like I run migrations. This is how you do that. Um, in, in distillery configuration. And then I have like a version. Again, this is just Elixir code. So like my version reads from this version file that all of my everything that cares about the version of this module reads from this one file, just has a number in it. 
uh, including when I generate the, the Docker container. I tag it with this files version. Um, I have a vm.args file, because I need that to configure things for meshing my Elixir network inside of my cluster. Um, and then I have like custom commands. If you haven't played with these in distillery, they're awesome. I can say like Firestorm migrate. That's a, that's a, that's a sub-binary that I can run, and it runs this shell script. Uh, it's just really neat. Um, so just wanted to show that off. Uh, so you've got your release. You use distillery, you generate this release, and now you want to like put it somewhere. You want to give it to somebody to run. So you do that with a container. Think of it as like your unit of application delivery. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the fact that you can't do hot, swap, hot code swapping if you're doing this. I thought that was going to be super important to me, and it was on exactly one project, but do this unless you really can't do this. Um, I'm not going to cover Docker in depth. I did want to just show real quickly what, a, um, what my Docker file looks like, because it's, it's good, and I've used it in production systems, and like, if you were wondering, huh, I wonder if this thing is good. Like, I think this is good. So I have two stages. Uh, the first stage, we take Alpine Elixir, and we're just going to build the release. So we install the build dependencies, we install hex and rebar, we add the files from our project, we remove the build and depths directory. I don't know. At some point, this caused me problems, and so it's in there. Uh, we get the dependencies, we digest the application, and we generate a release. And like, that's it for this container. It doesn't do anything except for generate the release. And then in the next step, we make a new container. So this is our actual output container. We only install the runtime dependencies. So I don't have C. I don't have a C compiler on here. I just have this uh, library. Um, and the rest of it is just base Alpine Elixir. Um, we copy the release that we generated in the previous container of, over into here. So this way, our entire container consists of Alpine Elixir, libstandard C, our release. Like we know everything that's in this thing. That's, those are all the files. Um, it's awesome. It's really small. It's, it's good. Uh, we expose a port, and we set an entry point. So like, I think you should do this for your entry point. It's just your release foreground is the entry point that's perfect for running on Kubernetes. Um, OK, so that's how you build your Docker image. But where do you build your Docker image? I use Cloud Build for this. You could do this in your CI as well. I probably will switch to that eventually. But I use this thing from Google called Cloud Build. I say, anytime I push to either of these two branches um, and it touches anything in the back end Elixir folder, run this cloudbuild.yaml file. And this is, this is just a thing that says run two steps. Build my thing, push my thing. It's easy. And so now every time I push to master, there is a new release pushed to my repository with the version specified. I really should only do this on tags. I haven't quite finished this setup. Uh, but, um, and then at that point, I can just use it, right? So like, I don't have to think about generating tags. I just know, like, I tagged a release, and it's in my registry now. Like, I don't have to think about it. I don't have to go check on it. It just works. Um, this is what it looks like to run a release. Not that important. Uh, so OK, so Kubernetes. So now you've got these images, and they're in your registry, and you want to run them. And Kubernetes is how you do that. It's an open source system for automated deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications. Uh, this is the part that I'm most excited about. This is the thing that I really, really wanted to show, uh, but I needed to convince you that you should build good systems first, because otherwise you might not care. Um, so I'm happier with my deployment strategy now than I have ever been before. Uh, I think this is like really, really good. Um, if you haven't used it before, I just wanted to show you some screenshots of the Google Kubernetes engine so you can like, get a feel for it. And so this is like, I'm running a bunch of services. There they are. Uh, this is one of them. It's got one replica running. It doesn't matter. But you can see it's in good state, because it's got a little green checkbox. Everything's happy. Um, these are like metrics about a given pod inside of that staple set that was running my Elixir application. And then also, I can just, like, in the browser, go into it. So I've got a remote console running here in my release. So this is running in the same VM that is serving production traffic. And I can just run code right from the browser. And like, that's really cool, but you shouldn't do it from the browser. You can do it from the console just like this. Say, so this is the node I want to execute on. Here's my namespace. This is the container. I want an interactive shell, and I want to run bash. And then cool, you're in your system. Um, if you're not using Kubernetes or something similar, uh, you're missing out. It's really good. And I say this as a person who missed out. People told me it was really good for like a couple of years, at least, before I really started getting into it. Uh, if you're using Kubernetes, then you want to gather metrics with Prometheus. It's like the cloud native foundation metrics gathering thing. Um, it exposes metrics using this open metric standard. It's not terribly important. Just know that there's a standard behind it. And then once you've collected metrics with uh, Prometheus, you will use Grafana to graph them. I just want to show you what this will feel like, like in your production Elixir system. With roughly 100 lines of code in your infrastructure repo, you can have these dashboards that show memory used by the runtime system, uh, broken down by allocator, and the metrics for the Erlang runtime on a particular node and plug, ecto, view rendering metrics. Uh, I built a custom dashboard to show response times on particular fields and particular queries in my GraphQL uh, schema. And it's super easy. And uh, you can see metrics across your cluster. 
uh, broken down by namespace, uh, which are how you segment applications inside of your cluster. You can look at metrics for a particular pod, which is like a particular running instance of a thing. Um, or utilization and saturation, saturation across your entire cluster, uh, or in a particular pod, or detailed information on a particular node, or on a single pod. And like all those things were like really cool, and honestly, it takes like 40 minutes to do it the first time, and like 10 minutes to do that the second time. And then this is the thing you have in your system. And it's not hard, and you should have at least something like this. And a lot of people do, but I just, if you don't, I just want to show it to you. And so to wrap up the talk, I'm going to show how to do this. I've got 10 minutes left, and uh, it's going to be a whirlwind, but it's going to be a fun whirlwind. Um, so we're going to take an Elixir application through the whole process, building a release, deploying it uh, on our infrastructure, and writing a description of the infrastructure as code. Uh, the thing we're implementing is uh, Firestorm. This is a new version. If you're not familiar with it, it's a forum that we wrote. It's open source. We're rewriting. We're like in the process of rewriting it, slash mostly to finish rewriting it. Um, and we're releasing that in a couple of weeks. Um, it's got a GraphQL API. It can be embedded, and you can have no API on it. It can just be a library that does forum data model type things for you if you just want to build your own thing on top of it. Um, we also built clients for it in Vue, React Native, and Elm, and Flutter. So in a couple of weeks, we're going to release content on this, so both building a backend uh, with GraphQL in both Elixir and JavaScript, in fairness, because sadly, I still have to sell stuff to people who only write JavaScript. And um, also, Vue, React Native, Elm, and Flutter front-end clients. So like, we built like, this whole thing, and it's awesome. And uh, if you're interested in seeing like, all that stuff and like, getting a taste for how to interact with GraphQL in a bunch of different, different systems, and maybe you're just doing React with GraphQL and it turns out like you want to see what the sheer joy it is to work with it in Elm, then uh, you can do that. Um, so you can sign up here for a newsletter uh, and also to get notified when it's released, that slash TBE, that stands for the big elixir. Um, anyway, and also if you want to deeper dive into the stuff that we're about to cover, which is the Kubernetes stuff, that's next month's content that we're releasing. Uh, so just sign up there, uh, give us your email address. We're, we won't spam you with anything except really cool developer news and opportunities to give us money. Um, so anyway, uh, imagine you're running everything in Kubernetes and like it's going great and you have this whole setup, but you want to easily manage multiple environments. You want staging. You need to add a QA environment. And like, what does that involve? If you've done Kubernetes, uh, a lot of times that involves copying and pasting a whole lot of stuff and uh, not really necessarily knowing which things mattered. Um, that's no good. You don't want to handwrite a bunch of YAML files. You don't want them to be coupled by shared data that's not shared data that you just have to remember to copy and paste properly. So for this reason, I'm going to show you a case on it. Uh, this is the piece that, like, I've had a thing where I wanted to have this continuously deployed uh, infrastructure repo for a long time. Because right now what I do is I, I go and apply it. And I might have some automation around it, but I don't have something that, like when master is merged in this repo, my infrastructure changes. And now I do. Like, that's, I say now I do. I have to actually write one final CI task. But I do have that with this. Uh, and it's a CLI that's like Rails new or Mix for Kubernetes. Uh, it's also a library for managing Kubernetes resources, so it helps you describe them quickly and concisely. Um, this is uh, just a real quick video. I'm not going to run it all, but uh, this, is a, this is how you apply the infrastructure. It's three words, KS apply default. I just applied my default infrastructure, and it's going to be there in my cluster, and like, it works. And that includes like SSL and uh, an ingress and like a whole bunch. There's like 27 services that run, and it's, it's that. Um, Anyway, uh, real quick, just to talk about how you should do Elixir stuff in Kubernetes, because I, there, are, there are tutorials that tell you to do the wrong thing, and I did the wrong thing because of them early on, because I didn't know uh, Kubernetes quite well enough. Um, you should use a stateful set instead of a, uh, a deployment for your, your Elixir cluster, because a deployment could reschedule a pod, and like you're, you've got a node in the cluster, and it's being talked to by other things, and it's like on a specific IP, and then like it gets paused and brought up on another machine with a different IP, and everybody's still talking to it, it, it confuses the, the runtime system. I'm told, but it sounds awful. I haven't actually seen it to cause a problem, but I've read many people say it, it causes a problem. And uh, outside of that, it, there are other benefits of doing a stateful set. So this is the code for it. I just want to show you code. Like, this describes my system. I've got uh, a number of replicas. These are defined in variables I'll show you elsewhere. I specify the container. I specify the ports available. I create these ports that are used for inter, uh, internode communication for the Elixir clustering. I specify all my environment variables. I, um, ultimately, that gets to, so this is, I don't know, what, 20 lines of code, probably. There's maybe four off screen. And that gets turned into 71 lines of YAML that are, are crappy to read. Um, and so I just wanted to show you, like, one of these is easier to write, right? I think that's better than four pages of this. Uh, but the point is not conciseness. The point is now I have, like, these variables. So, so this is, the, the stateful set is just one thing in a file that describes my infrastructure. So like, I have shared variables that they use, which means that when I change a parameter in a different environment, 
all of the things get the parameter changed. Whereas before, like the reason I wasn't using Kubernetes to its fullest extent is because I got sick and tired of just modifying YAML files by hand, honestly. Um, so that gets our release running on a series of machines. To get traffic routed to the stateful set, we generate a service and we tell it, hey, you should be pointing at the uh, app service port. And that's our stateful set. And here are your labels, so it knows who to talk to. Um, we have to generate an ingress. This is really easy. We have an ingress. Uh, we specify a global static IP. We give it the same name as everything else on this particular application. Uh, we share a domain. So there are three different places in our configuration that we have to say the domain in different ways, like environment variables and in YAML files. And like I have it, it's one, one thing in my environment. Uh, and this is one place it gets passed in. So it's nice. You have like configuration for your, for your infrastructure. Um, and then it specifies which service it's going to go to. And then you have like this internal headless service. So if you want to cluster your Elixir application, before that, that got me traffic, but if I wanted to use like WebSockets for chat, or, or sorry, Firestorm channels, uh, or sorry, Phoenix channels, or um, GraphQL subscriptions, uh, they kind of won't work really well because the thing's not actually meshed and they rely on being meshed or on using Redis externally, which you shouldn't if you don't have to. Um, so we also deploy this internal headless service. Its purpose is to help them find each other. Um, so it has the EPMD port and Erlang port that it, that it uh, promote, lets you access. Um, and it also gives us DNS so that we can reference each pod via DNS. Um, and then later we'll use that. And then the configuration. So like these are our components. So like I can specify my images at the top of this file. These are the things I change a lot. Uh, this is a particular environment. So I could go to staging and change, change the, well, in, a, in staging I could override the Firestorm image and it would generate, it would deploy a different image to staging. Um, this is the configuration for like this GraphQL thing. It's what, 15 things, and these are all the things that matter. Like, I don't have any, uh, you ever wonder which environment variables matter? Like, this is the list. Um, it's nice. And then this is it for, for the Elm project. It's, I just wanted to show it off and see how easy it was. And then with the lib cluster, you can cluster your Kubernetes project, uh, your, uh, sorry, your Elixir application inside of Kubernetes. Um, so this is a configuration that does that. Like, you can just find my slides later and do this, and then you have clustering, and it's easy. And it took me a while to figure out how I wanted to do it. And the new nodes that are added to the cluster will just automatically join the Elixir mesh. So like, it's neat, you scale up replicas, they become part of the thing, there's no extra thought. Um, and then this is a little bit of VM.org stuff you need to do. You need to specify which Erlang port you're gonna listen on. I don't remember if there's anything at the end of that line that matters as well. Um, and you also need like a long name. Anyway, and then this is like, I can show that I've got a node connection. So cool, I've got a, I've got a cluster. And then really quickly, I'm gonna show you how to get that Prometheus Grafana set up super fast. Um, so there's a case on it package named Cube Prometheus. And this is a lot of code, but it's, it's 100 lines of code, but it's like the same 100 lines of code that I'm gonna use for every cluster pretty much. Um, so I can use it, I can import this Prometheus thing, which gives me this whole big system with like 23 services running. Uh, it's three lines of code. Um, I can override the things that I care about inside of that. So one thing I do is I come in here and I say, for Grafana, for my GitHub authentication, I require that you be a member of the Daily Drip organization. This is cool, like, it's really cool that I can do that in config trivially. Um, and also I bring in some dashboards. So those dashboards you saw, these are just, I just import them and I copy and paste them from a repo online or in one case I wrote one. Um, and then like here I had to reach into a container and change like a readiness probe and the point is you can do that. You can like take these configuration things and then like tweak just one thing. Uh, so this is JSON it, case on it, it's really cool. Um, and then that gives you Grafana and then you need to instrument it. So here are the libraries that you should use in a Phoenix application or with, with Absinthe is the last one. Uh, to get all that data that you saw on the dashboards up into Prometheus, you don't have to really do anything. You have to, there's a little bit of boilerplate starting the things, but like use these things and you get all those dashboards. And it, I promise you it'll take no more than 40 minutes and it's really cool to have that. Um, and it'll help you actually build your system because you know how your system's doing because you got a bunch of cool pictures that show you how your system's doing. Um, anyway, so in summary, your systems require a process and you need to be the one that, that gives it. It needs to be well thought out. This is a starting point. You can use these ideas and generate a system, but you need to, you need to be thinking about these things. Um, your process needs to be better. So I hope that this helps you build successful systems. Um, and that's it. This is my, this is my first keynote. How'd I do? I have, I have 36 seconds left. So is there, is there a short question? Actually, I, I don't know how this works, but uh, yeah. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't look for anything that's Elixir specific for your CI. Um, Simba 4 has really good support for CI, for Elixir. Well, in version one, I think it's different in two anyway. 
But um, they've like been supporting the Elixir. So like they have heuristics they run, and Elixir was one of the first heuristics where they could say, I see you're running an Elixir app, I'll just go ahead and set up a good default test, test run setup for you. Um, but like I don't know what the Premiere, be, Premiere would be. Uh, I know that I really like the people at Simbafor. Like they really care and they do good work. And like uh, I was doing, when I was doing Firestorm early on, there was a bug with the version of PhantomJS they shipped and Wallaby. And they needed to be shipping a new, new version of PhantomJS for us to use the, the cookie bug, uh, the, the cookies. And so I reached out to them on their support and I said, hey, like, you really need to bump this up to minor versions and then like, everything will be good for Elixir people. And within 15 minutes, the default configuration for Elixir projects was changed to bump it up. So like, that's why I use them, honestly. Like, that interaction was, sold me. Anyway, uh, anybody else? Uh, yeah. What are your thoughts on uh, GitLab integrating CI? I think GitLab is freaking awesome. I think GitLab is probably the future. Um, I think it'll take me a while to get the level of confidence I have around like, the feature set. Um, and also, I really want to host my own GitLab. Um, but yeah, I think it's really cool. Like, definitely, GitHub is not a requirement. And as a general rule, GitLab is open source, so I would prefer it. So I would entirely anticipate that in two years, I'm using GitLab and not GitHub. Uh, question in the back. Uh, I'm just curious, like, are the libraries They will be available somewhere. Um, it'll be probably uh, a little bit. I have. Demonstrably, they're OK. I think they look pretty good. Uh, the actual underlying stuff, like there's a bunch of slides at the end that say a bunch of stupid stuff. So I'm not going to publish them just yet. But um, yeah, I'll make them available. And I'll, uh, I'll tell Brian he can tweet it. Cool. Or whatever, however that goes. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Well, cool. Everybody, uh, once again, thanks, Josh, Josh Adams. <laughs>